Good evening. Welcome to the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting today, Thursday, February 27th. We're going to stand for the pledge of Mr. Clone and please lead us. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, first off, I'd just like to um, point out that on February 5th, we had our Saratoga County Zone, Zoning and Planning Board Conference um, right in Saratoga here. And all the board attended. It was really good. We had some great um, speakers and really a good time to interact with some of those speakers and learn a lot more about the planning and zoning regulations that we have and a little bit more in depth on, on some areas that maybe we didn't have as much knowledge in. So we've all met our in-service uh, continuing education requirements for 2020, which is great. Um, that doesn't mean we won't have some more probably, but um, it was good to have, have that conference right off there. Um, all right, next on, on the agenda is the meeting minutes. So our meeting minutes were last from January 23rd. Do we have any comments, questions, or alterations to this? There a motion to approve the meeting minutes as written. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion that we adopt the minutes as presented. I'll second the motion. Okay. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Cullen? Yes. Mr. Smackdown? Yes. Chairwoman Sullivan? Yes. And then Mr. Manning. Well, Mr. Mr. Manning has got uh, called away on a family emergency, so he won't. We won't be sitting in tonight. Um, next on the agenda, we have a time for public comment. We don't have any public hearings tonight, but we will open it for any public comment if, if anyone would like to speak at this time. Uh, Ray Can you just state your name? Sorry. Yeah, Ray Outen, Sertino, Wick Avenue. Uh, I'm actually here representing the uh, emergency squad tonight. Uh, just a, a, a question. Uh, I know. In the zoning laws, uh, there are uh, certain things that need to be um, need to be followed as far as uh, fire codes and things like that. Is there anything in the town codes um, that would allow the EMS organization to become involved in, in looking at plans and, and seeing where there might be obstacles to getting people in and out uh, in an emergency? No, there shouldn't be any issue with that. Um, we'd be glad to, on the planning level, I think more than zoning, um, when we get a, a larger a larger yeah, project subdivision, um, we could include you as well as the fire uh, company, which we do for fire company access, obviously, right. uh, for the larger plans. But it wouldn't be a problem putting the package together and getting it down to you guys. Right. Reason, reason for that is uh, with all the senior housing uh, that is cropping up uh, in, in our, our town, which is great, uh, we do get more calls. So if we have better access to the uh, the living quarters, uh, it's just going to make everybody's job easier to make access, uh, getting in and out quicker, and that, you know, everybody knows that you know a few minutes can make are, are you Are you inquiring in regards to access to the actual building itself or access road-wise? Uh, access to the elevator, itself, elevator the information, layout, things, things like that. Things layouts, like that. Yeah. No, uh, we can we can include you on our large subdivision, <laughs> larger buildings. As um, as an example, one thing we've run into is when uh, bedrooms in apartments. A lot of times, when you go into the bedroom, there's a closet. You know, there's a space to the, you got to go in and turn, and there's a closet right in front of you. You can't move that closet. Mm -hmm. And if you need to get a stretcher in there, it's nearly impossible. Then we have to use other tools, and it can delay things. Whereas if the closet was moved to the adjacent wall and use that for dressers or whatever, then dressers can be moved, chairs can be moved. So it would make access just a little bit easier. It's you know one of the things that, that we uh, could yeah. do. Yeah, feel free, feel free anytime, get yourself or send a represent, uh, representative for Community Hub and uh, we'll talk about it and we'll get information from you guys and we'll send you a, a packet when it goes through planning. We have any larger projects, not a problem at all. Yeah. all right. Thank you. Yep. Great. Good suggestion. Thank you. 
Anything else? Okay, the public comment section is now closed. Um, next on the agenda, we have an area variance. Howard Amash? Amash. Amash, okay. Uh, and it's 720 Burgoyne Avenue, 177.5-1-1. If you'd like to come up um, to the to the speaker over here. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've never done this. That's before. all right. If I get we'll walk you through it. If I get mine, you just shut me down. My wife does. <laughs> all right. So you are here for an area variance. Yes. So first off, we'd like to to understand exactly what relief you're looking for okay just kind of explain you know in general terms obviously we, we have all the information but uh, in general terms kind of what the situation is and what relief you're seeking okay Manager, and Bill, maybe, maybe yeah. I can chime in first and help them out a little bit okay. uh, we were called out to the location um, I don't have the actual date here for a ticket but we were called out uh, for a, a complaint from a neighbor in regards to um, having his RV parked on the side of his house in front of the front plane of the house. In our code, section 167 um, K, section K, uh, it states in the RV storage uh, that the recreational vehicle shall not exceed, uh, extend beyond the front line, uh, line of the primary dwelling or closer than 60 feet from the road, whichever is less. So um, on, on the site inspection, we noticed that the, the uh, motorhome motor is in front of the front plane of the home. Um, we talked to Mr. Hamash, which he was gracious enough. He's been very, very proactive um, through the whole process. He's, everything we've asked, he, he's done. Um, and he's since moved the motorhome, which is a registered motor vehicle, to his driveway from the location that it was in. But it, and hence, he wants to go before the board to ask for relief from that 60 foot or front setback from the house. He has put, a, as you see in the pictures, he has put a uh, stone type driveway with retention on it. And uh, again, right now, he, with parking there, he is in violation, but he's before the board to try to rectify that. We have been out there, and as you can see, you have several, several complaints which were issued by his neighbors and they're in writing and you guys have copies of them. So, is it a 50 foot setback from the road? It, it's 60, 60 feet. Five zero, correct? Six, six zero. Six, That's six, the zero. actual setback? Yes. yes. Or the front plane of the house. The 60 foot was put into the code for the R2 rural zone. Oh. Most of the houses there are at 50 foot setbacks from the right of way. And that's why they say the front plane of the house. Okay. Uh, and there are, in the yard two, you have a 150 foot setback, so it allows you to go with with that uh, vehicle 60 feet from the right away. So, just to, I don't mean to, you know, if you want to go on with the other stuff, I just want to make sure I understood. It looked like it was 45 foot from edge of pavement. It's 45 foot from the edge of the pavement, 15, so, and 60 foot from the center of the road. Well, but just so, how far forward of the house is it? Uh, that okay. you can see from the pictures, it's it's the about half or a little over half of the RV is in front of the front plane of the house. Like twenty feet from my yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, but I just wanted to get yep. to figure out that as well. The other the other thing I know is too that the gentleman he's got it all stone. He's got. Uh, He's got the pressure treated lumber, four by sixes or four by fours, whatever he uses. Any, any, anything that was going to come off that RV is going to be contained in that stone, that stone area. That that area was a big sinkhole next to my house, and all it does is fill up the water, and I cut it. But uh, when I did the gravel, I found that my neighbor's roof drains, the pipes come over and drain underneath on into that hole. So I stopped that. Uh, what I did was put 13 tons of gravel there and moved it around myself, and leveled it off, as you say, four by fours, topsoil, mulch on it. And it looks very attractive. I've got pictures, you've probably got them there. Yes. 
and uh, I tried to make it look attractive, and I even went out and spent $1,000 on a cover, the exact color of the house. So uh, I did what I could to make it look good. We put it there because the other side of the house is impossible to put it. Now when you say impossible, what, what do you mean by that? The other side of the house has a easement for, I believe, sewer and water, a 30-foot easement along the road. And I'd have to lay gravel and roll it about 140 feet on the easement to even get the RV back there. I drove, we had another RV that was weighed half as much, and I drove it back there, and I had to have it towed out because it was too soft. I can't put a road on top of the easement. You can, you, you would just need to move it if they needed to get to the easement. Right, which would be, yeah. you know, like in the middle of the winter time. So you're saying that from the front, looking at the front of your house, you couldn't drive the RV up the side? No, it weighs too much. And it would only be 15 foot from the road, which is a lot worse than 45 feet. It would be 15 foot from the main road. I, under, I, I have a drawing in front of me, yeah. and there's, it shows a tree in the back of the RV. Yes. Is that is that a tree that um, uh, I'm not I'm not going to say anything about trees or anything, but is that would that be a tree that could possibly cut down and could move the RV back that much further? Okay, that's a 50 foot red maple. It's the nicest tree on my property, and it shades the deck. Okay. and kitchen, but looking at it, I could cut all the lower branches off and move the RV back another 10 to 12 feet. And because there's nowhere else to put it, if I had to, I would take that tree down and go right up to the fence, but it would still be a few feet from the front of the house. Mm -hmm. But I would do whatever it takes. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want you to go cut your feet down or anything like well, that. Well, you know, whatever it is. Madam Chair, too, on the, uh, the Grand Avenue side, as you see here where the easement is okay. located on your map, uh, you would have to get a, a curb cut from the town, seeing it be a, would be a town road, and it is awful wet over in there in, in the, the back section, so it would be uh, it would be a challenge for him to, to establish a road come off Grand Avenue if the town and the other the other issue that he might have is sight distance for cutting a culvert there he's right at an intersection with his house uh, so he would probably have a challenge as well to get a uh, clearance from DPW with sight distance to, to put a, a road cut curb cut in to, to establish a driveway on the side now well from where it's parked currently in the driveway is that is that an issue as far as it, from the code? In the code standpoint, when it's in the storage mode, if it's if it's registered, a registered motor vehicle, and it's functioning and moving, it's considered a registered motor vehicle, and we have no jurisdiction over it. If it was unregistered and in the driveway, yes, it would be an unregistered motor vehicle. Um, the Hence, in the code, under Section K of 167, as you can see, I think everybody has a copy of it. It's the storage part of it, winter storage. Mm -hmm. so, so the simple answer is that as the applicant stands <coughs> before the board now, he's, in, un he's un not in violation. Right, unlike when he filed the application, he was not in compliance, but now he's in compliance. Correct. Uh, could I mention that we're 70 years old and we're about to retire, and uh, we bought that to use. We've had it 11 months and we've put 12,000 miles on it. So it doesn't sit there that much. We have children in South Carolina, Tennessee, Florida, and it doesn't stay there that much, but it's just there for the storage in the winter and maybe next year it might not be there for that, depending, God willing. So, so you've had the RV for about a year? 11 months. Did you have another RV before that? We had a lighter one that was smaller than that and lighter. 
and that's the one we drove across the other side line. On the easement, the easement and, side. Yeah. And it got caught there. We had to have it towed out. And it was just too heavy to go back in there, and that was half the weight. Then after that, when that happened, did you move it over to this other side? Did the you? other one? Uh, we traded it in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just trying we to establish... We used it and we traded it in. I'm just trying to establish myself how long you've had the RV and how long the RV's been in the yard, you know, in, on that property uh, for okay. whatever well, duration it's been there. Yeah, ours has been, the new one's been there 11 months and the other one was there two years. Okay. And we've had, I've talked to my closest neighbors behind me on one side of me and on the other side of the other neighbor, and none of them have any problem with it. I just have one neighbor that has a problem, and when I was doing it, her husband came over and spent the time of day and talked to me and never had a complaint. And we did it in September, and they complained in January. How far back is that shed that's behind your RV? Um, I, I assume it's behind the uh, fenced-in area. The shed? Yes. Well, that's way in the backyard. It would there be a way? I know there's a fence, obviously, in the way. But is there a way to open up the fence and have the RV all the way as far back as you basically as far back as you can go? Obviously, the trees is in the way of that. I'd have to take the tree down, part of the deck, my wife's garden's out, and that goes downhill back there. Bill? I, 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 I sort of need, I just want to understand the code a little bit, if you sure. don't mind. That's okay. When it says here, um, covered at all times, I see that you got this mushroom thing over it, or whatever you I want to call it. Is that what they're talking about? Pretty much. They, they wanted to, the intent, I believe, and again, I'm speaking so I'm thinking if you got covered on the roof, you know, a roof yeah. is covered. I'm just trying to understand if there's any kind of language or is there anything that tells us what that really means? I don't know that there's a definition. I don't think there's a definition for cover. The cover is the I have cover. no pictures here. Oh, okay. That's, it. That's why I call it a mushroom. The cover. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and I just have a, a couple other questions, if you don't mind. Um, it seems like um, there's a, you know, whatever happens here, it's going to be an expense. Maybe. I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what, where we're going with this, but maybe there's going to be, a, you know, if you move it back or cut down trees or whatever it happens to be. Um, what people, it, it, I don't know anything about RVs, I'm sorry. Uh, are there places, obviously you don't go sit in it when it's sitting there. No. So are there places where, you know, like people that have tractor trailers, they park the tractor trail somewhere, get in their car and drive home, is that... Something that's done? I don't know. Is there are buildings where they store RVs, yes. There is. Is that like really expensive? Or? Yes, yes. I'd like how much? Uh, 25 to $50 a foot. <coughs> a what? A foot. A year? A foot. No, I get that for a year or? For the, for the winter months. Okay. So you're talking this, what, 50 feet long? Uh, 32 feet long. 32 feet long. 32, so about a thousand bucks. I guess so. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. I'm just trying to get, yeah. you know, look at all the different. <clears throat> if you look at the picture here, that one tree, I mean, if he, uh, worst case, if he. I, I plan to go out there and physically yeah. see it. I, I saw the thing where you had moved it, but I figured I wanted to hear what you had to say. But you want to have all the options in your head as you're yep. walking around. Yeah, it's only there for the bad months in the winter time, and like I say, it might not be there next winter. But I well, we got to deal with what's next. Yeah, I made I made use of the sinkhole there and made a nice area for it. 
it's not a retention pond. It is not. <laughs> no. No, the property was... actually drains backwards if, uh, like Mr. Mosh was saying, it uh, pitches back to a, a shed, which the neighbor hinted to, and just to give you a little clearance on the shed issue that was listed in the one, the shed was an existing shed from uh, 1990, or 1993 the house was built. The shed was built prior to our accessory structure. I looked back in zoning and the, and the previous zoning books and there was no accessory structure set back when the shed was built. Mr. Amash, a few years back, we got a call from, uh, I believe the same neighbor, to go out for a complaint of, uh, he, he fixed it up, put new roof and siding on it, but he didn't move it, move the structure or anything. And we went out there, we, I talked to him then, and uh, he was not in violation of anything. <coughs> Uh, but the neighbor, uh, again, highlighted that, in, as you can see in the... Uh, Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> now, it, it, and again, uh, the neighbor was just concerned. Yeah. It was a concern of the neighbor, and we addressed it. And Mr. Amash has been, uh, he's been up, upright and forth with the uh, building department. No issues. Well, I could take, like I say, I could cut all the lower branches from that red maple. Or move it back another 10. Ten foot or so, even. Be closer to that. Now, do you, do you have any sort of um, neighborhood rules or homeowner? No. Anything like that? That There's no association. Okay. No problem with that. Uh, pretty much everybody keeps themselves. Mm -hmm. and we do well with our neighbors. Can, can, can I just ask you, I'm sorry, just to clarify that, when you say you have no association, I understand that, I appreciate that, there's no homeowners association, do you know offhand whether or not your neighborhood is subject to what's called typically declarations of covenants and restrictions? I wouldn't even know what that is, okay. I'm sorry. Sometimes they restrict, for instance, a commercial vehicle, boats, uh, they restrict sheds. Uh, things like that. I, it just covered under our, our, our one district zoning. Really? Okay. Anytime I have a question, I come here to the town and ask, like when I fixed up the shed, I had a question, do I need a building permit? I come to the town. Anytime there was a complaint, I came to the town and said, what do we need? Thank you. So. Any other questions from me? I could mention that probably about five houses down on the other side of the street. There was an RV larger than mine on the side of the house for the past 10 years, sticking out with no complaint. They blacktopped that spot. And on my way here down Rollins Street, and I'm going by three RVs, and there's no problem with them. I don't care what anybody else does. I just have to take care of my own problem. Okay. Thank you. Um, what I what I like to do, and everyone on the board knows this now, um, I like to just go over the um, the area variance um, criteria. So just so everyone knows, just a good reminder as we kind of um, seek to understand um, kind of what's going on here and for any future area variance actions as we make a decision on, on this particular action. So, um, in its consideration of the area variance, the, the Board of Appeals shall take into account the benefit to the applicant, the variance is granted, as weighed against the detriment to the health, safety, and welfare of the neighborhood or community by such grant. In making such determination, the Board of Appeals shall also consider, A, whether an undesirable change will be produced in the character of the neighborhood or a detriment to nearby properties will be created by the granting of the area variance, B, whether the benefit sought by the applicant can be achieved by some, some method feasible for the applicant to pursue other than an area variance, C, whether the requested area variance is substantial, D, whether the proposed variance will have an adverse effect or impact on the physical or environmental conditions in the neighborhood or district, and E, whether the alleged difficulty was self-created, which consideration shall be relevant to the decision of the Board of Appeals, but shall not necessarily preclude the granting of the area variance. 
The Board of Appeals, in the granting of variances, shall grant the minimum variance that it shall deem necessary and adequate, and at the same time preserve and protect the character of the neighborhood and the health, safety, and health of the community. So that's just from that's just from our code. So um, good reminder on that. Um, you're all set as far as talking. So what we'll do, we're just going to do a little housekeeping right now. Um, so first I need a motion to declare the ZBA the lead agent for, for Seeker. And this is a type 2 action, which is exempt from the Seeker and further environmental review. Not the language. It doesn't have to be anything. It is just exempt. You okay. Just make that determination. Okay. It's exempt. You don't have to be an agent. Okay. All right. For a type two. Okay. Yeah. So we can just have a motion for that. Yeah. It, yeah. And, and it is okay. it's exempt. Okay. All right. So do we need to? to, to you don't. You, you don't. Okay. It's All exempt. right. Okay. Excellent. Um, so next we'll have to set a, a motion for the public hearing. Um, which will be uh, next month, which will be Thursday, March 26th, okay? And that will be at 7.05, so we give ourselves a little little bit of time there. Um, but so next month, just so you're aware, we'll come back. Your neighbors or whoever um, wants to come will be able to come and talk um, and speak in regards to this action. So can I get a motion for that, please? Sure. Mr. Yes. Mr. Cullen? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mosh, for coming, and we'll see you next month. Oh, okay. You're welcome to stay. I'm not kidding. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> More important business. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Next on the agenda. We have the uh, use variance for Boyhaven Munter property, 3430, Boyhaven Road, 162-1-14.1. So, first off, just to give a little um, background, I guess, and then I'll, I'll let you speak. Um, so this is, as I, as I stated, is a use variance. Um, it has come before the planning board for a minor subdivision and special use permit as well. Um, they were proposing a subdivision of the 69 acres of the Boyhaven parcel involving the two ponds and most of the premises that the building's on for the purposes of um, conveying the parcel to a corporation for the operation of a youth summer camp. Um, in addition to this requiring a, a minor subdivision approval, it is also a use in the R2 zoning district that requires a special use permit and site plan approval. Uh, finally, there was some definition conflicts in our zoning code regarding camps, dwelling units, and family, which have caused this proposed use in construction of bunk cabins to obtain the use variance from the ZBA. So, um, with that said, the planning board has uh, taken lead agency on this application as far as the secret goes. So, um, that has been completed. They were declared an unlist. This was declared um, an unlisted action as well as as the ones that were before them as well. So, um, without further ado, all right. So, <clears throat> I mean, code enforcement yeah. officer can probably yeah, read out on this as well. Yeah. And we can follow them. Madam Chair, yes. um, the applicant was before the planning board with some issues and. Uh, then sent kicked down to you guys for uh, interpretation of uh, parts of our code de in the definition section of camp. Um, uh, there was a question in the definition of camp, the question in dwelling unit and family um, in, in the camp definition. The definition of family, as you can read, uh, pretty clearly states in the second part of it uh, that uh, an individual in the in the structure, such as a camp counselor running running the uh, the unit in charge of the unit, I think that's to me was pretty clear as the intent of uh, the seasonal structures which the applicants looking to put onto the the property. They're looking to have four bunk units with uh, twelve uh, beds in each unit, six uh, bunk units, 
in a seasonal structure. Uh, I believe the big, uh, with talking to council, the definition of dwelling unit is more a, a, of a permanent structure, habitable structure, and I think uh, what the applicant is looking for is a seasonal type structure. Um, I myself and council have talked back and forth on it, and, and, and I guess the variance is basically for the definition explanation. In my in my opinion, uh, our definition of camp is a little different than what you have in the packet for the state's definition. I think the state's definition is a little uh, a little more what the average person would describe a camp as. And, and again, it kicks you back to the dwelling unit when you read our code. And our dwelling unit definition is more of a permanent structure. So I think there's just that gray area that they want to clear up, clarify for the applicant in, in order to process his planning board application. Um, do you have anything else, Council, that you could add to that? I, I don't know that I do, um, other than just to try to help the board, sorry, focus um, the specific subsection yep. that I understand the applicant to, I think, have appropriately raised as a question is um, within section 180 dash 4 2 and then it's subsection a and then it's sub part and I apologize um, two that states such cabins or cottages shall be designed for one family only with not more than two such dwelling units permitted per gross acre ie a maximum gross density of two dwelling units per acre and, and I think respectfully the I can't speak for the applicant, but you, as I understand it, you can't reconcile that definition with both the past use of the property and then the present contemplated, <coughs> contemplated use in the present for the yeah. future. You know, I think that's where the code enforcement officer really found the discrepancy in the use versus the way the town code is written. You know, there's not a clear way to define uh, our use against what the town code is, what it comes down to. And it's so, all really odd in that it's under the definition of camp, yeah, right. which the proposed <laughs> use is more consistent the camp to some extent than the definition. So when the, I mean, to take this to the next level, when the, the camp operators and the code Compliance uh, interpreter, call it architect, looked at the DOH code, which is New York State Department of Health. Um, New York State Department of Health, after the CO is issued, is the governing agent of the camp from here on. The water, waste, bed count, and overall operation. So the Department of Health will annually or semi-annually uh, obviously check to make sure that the, you know, the camp is in compliance with their rules like they do in restaurants and elderly uh, homes and what so uh, code compliance uh, the main check since there was some discrepancy in the town code was to make sure that when it gets farther down the line it will be with the state rules for camp operation. Right. It, the, the camp is subject to fire safety inspections through the through the town's code enforcement office on a year an annual basis along with uh, documentation from the New York State Health Department for water. They monitor the water sewer uh, water and sewer. You'll have to have a water professional on, exactly. on staff which will do a, a monthly or weekly uh, water testing while the camp is in use yearly whenever the camp is in use and, and submit reports to the Department of Health. And again, I'd like to refer everybody on the board to the New York State definition of the camp, which I think was issued to everyone. It, it's definitely a, a clear a clear vision in my mind to what a, a seasonal camp structure would, how it would operate. Ours is a little vague. I think if the, the interpretation, it's just, a again, a, a mental interpretation of a seasonal as compared to uh, a structure in our in our dwelling unit is more 
to a uh, habitable space, I think. Yeah, and I mean, when it comes to the density, I don't know if you have this map, but um, the size of the parcel versus the number of what we even consider a dwelling is very minor. It's not like the increase in the density to the point of uh, anything being construed as high density. This is still extremely yeah. low density. I mean, it's um, the, the reasoning behind these new, and this is a basically just a cap. It's an uninsulated, unfinished um, bunkhouse. Uh, when the Boy Scouts used to camp, they probably had people housed in lean-tos and things of that nature, which uh, the types of uh, campers that will be using this might want to have more of a, a closed door uh, overnight dwelling than some of the uh, ways that the Boy Scouts ran, so it'll just be a little more up to date with what people would consider a, an overnight camp for kids at this point. So. Yes, and, and Madam Chair, I, uh, the Mr. Muncher, the applicant, submitted plan uh, a preliminary set of plans for the. It's a 24 by 24, uh, as uh, Mr. Muncher said, 24 by 24. Um, seasonal structure, no insulation, no sheetrock, but it, it is proposing electric with smoke carbon monoxide detectors and emergency lighting to meet the fire code. So it is a base structure, not a habitable dwelling in that you could, uh, it's a seasonal from April to whatever, whatever the guidelines that the uh, planning board puts in effect uh, for weather permitting uh, structure that they're proposing. Well, I definitely appreciate you coming kind of before us and addressing, kind of self-addressing this this issue with, with the code and with the <coughs> My dad is the one that's really uh, involved with the camp people and uh, my, myself and my siblings send them to Florida for a few weeks a year, so <laughs> that's our vacation. But, um, <laughs> um, so um, I'm here basically representing my dad, but um, you know this, this camp group that he's connected with, it's based out of Rochester that has another facility similar to this out in that region that wants to operate this. Um, they're great people. Uh, I think that They'll do a phenomenal job reinvigorating that camp and hopefully getting numerous uh, young adults per year away from phones and Wi-Fi and video games and all of that good stuff to uh, you know, fishing poles and uh, <laughs> mosquito bites and bow and arrows and things of that nature rather than uh, you know shooting somebody on a video game screen. So, uh, but. It's a, in their opinion, um, you know, it was their choice to want to add these structures um, as the operators, and uh, with the group sizes that they want to have, with the number of counselors and the amount of beds that exist, um, they really needed to have some more facilities to be able to make the numbers work. You know, so it's, <clears throat> to them. Uh, with the number of work without these extra beds, it's probably, you know, maybe not. I don't, we haven't really talked about that, but most chances are they'd say this really wouldn't be enough facilities for us with what's presently there. Some of the stuff that's presently there is on the fringe of really not being that usable. Some of the lean tos and things of that nature, uh, we're probably not going to get it. <coughs> kid as modern as today to want to go sleep in that lean to, um, whereas the Boy Scouts would have years ago. So, um, you know, just the evolution of things and how to make this really uh, be a success when it opens is the reasoning behind adding these structures. Yeah, that's that's a, I'm glad you pointed that out because one of the the things that we look at for the use variance is um, reasonable return. Um, cannot realize a reasonable return. So 
Um, appreciate the point, you know, yeah, I mean, the point about that because obviously at some point you have to have a, you know, <clears throat> making money and not losing money to, exactly. to make money. Exactly. Hardship is, mm -hmm. uh, is the term, right? So, yeah. you know, their, their numbers have to be great enough to be able to uh, pay their insurance and all their counselors and themselves and whatnot to keep the place open. It's not going to be an inexpensive place to run and maintain, so they need to really have a, a decent count uh, in the short season that we have here. So. Madam Chair? Yes. You know, I, I, I read through this. Um, I think what your family's doing is phenomenal. Um, I, I can't take any crap. <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's my dad. Yeah, I know. I, well, I sat next to him a couple of meetings. You know, I, I, you can pass that on, right? <laughs> but, but I'm trying to synthesize down. This, you know, I'm looking at definitions and I'm looking at this, looking at that. Is it possible, Mr. Attorney, to or belt to to just synthesize this down? You know, instead of like looking at definitions of camp and thing, let me see. It, I just want to make sure that I got it. Okay. You, you, you need our permission to build a few more buildings or a building or two. So, and, and we have to say that these buildings are going to be for kids and not for a family. Is that one of the issues? I, no, no, not really. I just, I'm it, just it, trying I mean, to get, if you could help the, me. The definition of a dwelling yeah. unit, I think, is the, the thing that sticks out in the code, it, it states habitable structure with right. amenities right. or whatnot, yeah. which is a more year-round atmosphere. Right. Whereas they're asking for something that a dwelling unit, our dwelling unit definition doesn't describe what they're what they're uh, putting forth to the planning board, and they're looking just for the clarity on that. I think they're they're asking for something that is not year-round habitation. It's a seasonal product that's just for their camps, the, the kids to come and enjoy the summer and, and operate from a set date, which I'm sure the planning board will, will put dates of operation on the, on the uh, camp. That and and that, that'll cover the ranges for them to stay in. It, the, the structures that they're building will meet fire code, will meet safety, fire safety codes, uh, but they're not to be habited off-season. You know, in winter months. I get that. I, I, maybe I, I, I probably, please forgive me, I, I don't think I was clear. The remedy of the applicant, mm -hmm. what exactly, you know, if you could encapsulate it down to a couple of sentences, not, you know, is it, we have to give you permission to build something we don't already have in our rules? Is that what you're saying? I'm just trying to figure out what the, Issue is before us. What, what relief you're seeking? Yes. Yeah, you kind of. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just. I'm looking at all this. Relief from a definition, I guess, would be the. the we have to rewrite the zoning law. Is that it, or? Uh, or give an interpretation it's, of dwelling unit. That's what that is. And that that's part of the problem is that I think in this applicant's instance, they've identified a circumstance, and I think rightfully so, where. It's not a matter of interpreting that section uh, because the definitions that we've all laid out in terms of dwelling unit and the definition of family, by the way, um, all of these definitions, I'll illustrate it, conflict and are, are in essence in opposite of the intended use and of their proposed project. And it may sound odd to you because these conflicts all occur within the, under the subheading of camp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're sort of completely in opposite of what you think of camp. And so the applicant's stuck with these restrictive definitions that do not permit that multi-bunked, not uh, multi-bunked seasonal so unit. So use variance? Is that what we're basically saying? That's right. right. Yes. That's exactly right. There's not really a clear definition in the yeah, right. I get that. Process. I'm just trying to think of what the remedy is. I, I just want to see if we decide, yeah, we want to go ahead with this, what do we have to focus on? I, I'm just trying to narrow the, the it down. The focus will be ultimately to define and describe.
the exact okay. use that you're now getting the presentation on. So we would because say a use variance that would include these things. Okay. Correct. Correct. And, and ironically. That makes it a lot simpler for me. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I because believe me, I'm I looked at this and I kept going, what? Well, we have a lot of boards for a lot of different purposes. And when this got handed to me, I was sitting there going, yeah. All right, wait a minute. What? <laughs> okay, so I'm not alone. No, right. no. <laughs> and, and it's bizarre because we're proceeding under the right section. And it's camp, but, 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 I get it. but I camp's get it. not defined. No, no, I get it, I get it. I, I have it. a feeling that when the, cold, when the cold writer got to camp, they were probably pretty <laughs> tired and said, you think we're going to need to really do much with that? Nah, let's just keep going. Yeah, you know, know. Once you got to already, they don't worry about it. Right. Yeah. I, I, what I'm understanding and everything, now in the Adirondacks, I know there's different campgrounds and campsites, and they have the same type of dwelling what you're talking about. No. I, I know this for a fact because I, I've been at one of those facilities, okay? And they're, they're housed, there's, you know, there's no insulation or anything. They have electric, they have the smoke detectors and everything else in there that they do. Mm -hmm. Some are even older, they were built way back when, but some are newer now. They, the state has updated those facilities, okay? Uh, they're just a plain structure and they're open from this date to that date. And in the winter, they're shut down. And it's, it's, Pretty much cut and dry. And like I say, I, I, from what I hear, what you want to do and what Bill has explained, I think it's. Yeah, I mean, the whole facility of this renovation has to be brought to code. There's not a single part of it that will be in use that won't be compliant with code. Right. They get, you know, everything that was there that wasn't compliant under the old use is now being renewed to be code compliant. So, um, you know, that, but that goes deeper than this board. Um, and we're at the Board of Health level, which right. is actually harder than these guys, because they're the ones that are, um, you know, fire code stuff and everything technically is pretty easy. When it comes down to making sure no one's going to get ill from a, an invisible bug in water, that's a different story. So, um, those are the you, you, you almost have like BEC out with yes. that type of thing. Yeah. You know, like I say, they have their people that come out and inspect these facilities. Like Bill was saying, I, I think it's usually, they do it seasonal. I mean, inspect them in the beginning of the, the season, then they might come back during the halfway of the season or at the end of the season. But they do, they do make periodic checks. Any other questions at this point? Okay. Um, next, we have to look at a, um, a public hearing. Um, had some discussions with, with Planning Board, with John Barto, as well as um, um, Bill Kennery, our council. And um, we felt it was um, wise and probably prudent to have a separate public hearing to keep things kind of clean and straightforward because obviously this action is, uh, I feel like, a little bit more straightforward than, than the ones before the planning board. We don't want to muddy, muddy things up at all. Um, so we're going to have a separate one. They're only a week apart, so it shouldn't you know, delay anything as far as that goes. I think you probably have more from the planning perspective to kind of look at. So um, can I get a motion to schedule the, the public hearing for this action? It will be, since we have one prior to that, will be at 7.30 or thereafter on March 26th. Can I get a motion for that, please? So moved. I'll second the motion. Okay. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Cullen? Yes. Mr. Snazow? Yes. Chairwoman Sogan? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, and that is it for tonight. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn, please? So have you stole Meg's thunder because Meg's I'm sorry. her question is so tell me exactly